Kartikeya Sarabhai was born into a family of industrialists in Ahmedabad, India, and still plays an active role in his family's extensive business activities. His father, a scientist, was the founder of India's space program. His mother was a danseuse. Kartikeya Sarabhai firmly believes that resolving the environmental crisis requires that people learn to think differently and live differently, and so he has devoted much of his life to environmental education. Sarabhai himself was educated at Cambridge and MIT and is the director of the Center for Environmental Education, which he founded in 1984. Beginning as a small local initiative, the center has grown into a national and international organization with 40 offices and 400 professional employees. It advances the cause of environmental education by working on the development of green curriculum with every state government in India and in every language in India and also with governments, the media, educational institutions, and other organizations in Sri Lanka and Australia. Well, my grandfather's grandfather was known in Ahmedabad city as for his love of trees. And mm. I was just thinking that uh, this sort of runs uh, very deep. But I think um, my grandfather came from an industrial family. And at 18, he found himself um, to be the head of the family because his uncle had died, his parents were not there, and really reshaped what that family was. It was a very nationalistic family. He wanted a different education from what was being given uh, to people. And he had heard about Madame Montessori, who was just starting her work at that time. And he called her over to Ahmedabad to start a school for his children. He had eight children, and he started the school. So first of all, the children. Uh, uh, had a very different education from what most people had. He was someone who really believed in people pursuing their individual uh, values and what they did. So his own sister uh, was sent to the London School of Economics to, to avoid being married to someone her uncle was going to do. And when she came back, she started the first labor union while he was the head of the Mill Owners Association. And the first major strike which happened, and this was the time when Mahatma Gandhi had just come to India, and he was making a home in India. And it's a wonderful story of how that, that got resolved. But they would, uh, they would fight during the day. There was a major strike. And in the evening, they would dine together. And each of the children have played a different role in, in public life, in, in industry, and in innovation, which has been wonderful. And it was that heritage which obviously did come to me. My mother herself was also from a illustrious family, and uh, her, her grandmother was part of the Constituent Assembly of India. She herself was a dancer from the South, and uh, started a dance school in Ahmedabad when uh, dancing was considered something which people from good families didn't do. And she had to meet with that resistance. My father was a scientist and started India's space program, and, and also a successful business person. So there were all these streams of thought, if you like, which, which were coming in. And I think it surely influenced the way I, I am and what I did. When I went to study abroad first, which was at Cambridge in England, I thought I would do physics and mathematics, because that was a passion. It was something my father was doing. And, you know, it just seemed like that. But then the London Times was running a series called India's Disintegrating Democracy. And it would make my blood boil you know, to, to read this. But I, I realized I didn't have the words to even contradict it. I had not read about anything. I had not known anything. Uh, there was a drought going on in the state of Bihar in India. And it was incidentally the last drought India has really faced in uh, 67, 68. And uh, I went there, and I told my father that that summer I would like to spend time. And I was amazed at how much voluntary work was being done. Uh, and I felt that, look, that's really what I want to do, that I would like to work in the area which connects with development more directly than what I could do in a lab. And I told my father that I would like to change in the, what I was doing. So I finished physics and mathematics and then went to MIT, where they were also looking at international development and understanding how technology has to marry with social sciences and many other disciplines. Uh, to, to understand the development process. So my interest really was not in the environment per se, it was really in development at that stage. 
and the en environment interest came later. Yeah. yeah. Well, you came to see a relationship, a, a, a strong relationship between the two, right? Yes. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, my interest in, um, in, in the relationship started when I started work in the city of Ahmedabad, doing a survey of people, asking them what they would see the city to be in this way of time called 2000. You know, it, 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 it really seemed like futuristic at that time. And I was amazed that most of the answers were not to do with we want broader roads or we want footpaths or we want taller buildings. They were to do with the fact that a woman could could see a late night movie and even with jewelry walk alone back to her apartment without feeling scared. And they said, we want that to be there. And I was asking myself the question, what is it in that environment that makes it possible in Ahmedabad but doesn't make it possible in Delhi or New York to be able to do that? And I refused to think that it was only something inherent in the culture of the place. But I did find it was an environmental issue. So the first time I really used the word environment was in the context of an urban environment and how human beings, human beings behaved in an urban environment. And I was looking at why is it that in some places neighbors don't talk to each other and in some places there's a great sense. And is it because the architecture is such that it creates niches, for instance. There are places which are not just streets, which are, which are linear but you create spaces which have nooks and corners. And in fact, even if you see animal life, bird life, if it's in those nooks and corners which most interesting things happen. And yet we, we develop places which removes these nooks. You know, we, we try to make them everything straight. Uh, and, and I realized that environment, and it was, it was later that it evolved from there to looking at the natural environment and what people do. We were on a, on a hill just outside outskirts of Ahmedabad city, which was barren. And there were people herding cattle who lived around us. They would easily come in and graze and nothing would, would work. And I, um, in exasperation, just called them in and talked to them. And I said, um, look, we are trying to build this institution. And I'm trying to establish a little wooded area. I know you want water and you are so-called stealing it today, but there's no need of stealing. You can walk in through the front door and, and get water. Your children can come here and pick the berries, which we had. You can even take the grass, but cut it. Don't, don't bring the cattle in. Uh, but I want to do this. And they said, will you give us a moment? And they all huddled together and came back. And they said, we think your proposition is fair. And the next day, next day, it completely stopped and all our trees started coming up and we had this wonderful green patch and then someone from Ford Foundation in those days came and saw us and she said, do you know what this is called? It was called social fencing. You know, I was sort of, uh, all these jargon started coming in. It, it was social forestry and they said that if you can do this with this hill, can't you use your communication skills to do it for the state? And suddenly we went into forestry. Which was not there. I mean, it, it came about through this experience, but it was it was an experience which was inclusive of, of people thinking of a problem, uh, not just as a as something to grow trees and say build a bigger wall could have been a solution. We couldn't afford it in those days, but it could have been. We could take that type of solution or excluding people. But how that if you if you appeal to the good senses of humanity, if you like, that people are in fact, wanting a solution, it's just that they've not seen a connection between this. And, and I think those learnings were very important for us in the, in the way we grew. So we, we moved from, from looking at the urban man-made environment to greening to larger environmental issues to looking at issues of water and other sustainability issues. They're all connected. They are absolutely, yeah. they, are, they, are, they are connected and sometimes connected uh, even in non-intuitive ways. Sometimes you think it's just the intuitive connection which, which, uh, which is there. Um, I, I give you an example of that. Uh, the white back Indian vulture, 98% uh, of that disappeared within a period of three years or four years. 
and it's perhaps the largest drop of any bird species anywhere in the world. Now, no one could understand what, what could have caused it. Nobody is killing the vulture. Right? And what they what then research found was there was a drug called diclofenic sodium, which was given to cattle. And it's perfectly good for cattle, but the cattle when they die and the and the birds eat, the vultures eat that, they accumulate the substance. And that's what's killing it. And I was also connected at that time to a pharmaceutical veterinary company, which was making this drug. It's a family business. It's a family right? business, yes. Yeah. Sarawai yeah. Chemicals yeah, right. was one of the largest veterinary businesses. And we were we were making this drug. And it, it was never connect, it was never thought that this drug could have any effect on this bird. And it was an interesting issue of also trying to resolve yeah, resolve so this issue. How do you do that? Well, when I talked to our, our, our firm, they said, look, if we don't make it, it's a typical business argument, that if we don't make it, somebody else will. And therefore, we will just take our market share out and someone else will come in. Uh, so let the government ban it. This was the typical argument. When it's banned, we will not do it. Obviously, you can't do it. I said that was not a good enough answer. And I said, let's look at it more positively. So what we did was we got the industry together, in fact, the different people who were making it, including competitors, and said, can we find another substance which would do the same thing, which was another chemical called meroxichem, uh, which could substitute this. And let us all switch to that. Because there was no law in India at that time, even today, which says that you have to test a drug not from the point of view of the uh, to the person or the animal which is you are treating, but you have treated one more step, which is what an environmental food chain does. There is no food chain testing uh, which is required. So voluntarily and through then working with the Ministry of Environment and other things, the whole industry put a ban on this drug and it, it changed. But one, uh, uh, one saw the insides of that. But let me say that this has also helped me a lot because, because of the family being both in industry and in the public sphere, mm -hmm. I do understand the language mm -hmm. which it needs to bridge it. And therefore, to think of environment and development as two different uh, spheres or industry as someone just being negative uh, is, is not the way I look upon it. And I, I do feel that you can change. Uh, you, you can change it because you do need a certain amount of industrialization, you do need development, but how do we remodel that development strategy uh, to, to be sustainable? And that's a, that's a very major, major challenge. Well, it is, and, it, and it's interesting that you, that you were able to do that because I think there's a tendency among environmentalists to sort of say, well, these guys, I mean, if you say a typical yes. business argument, you've heard it lots of times yes. and you think, what can you do? But in fact, if you do go uh, with the right yes. language and the right attitude, perhaps you can do something. Yes, this um, uh, a colleague of mine who started this this the CEE uh, uh, industrial group. For instance, I've never heard him use the word pollution mm -hmm. when he when he talks to industry, and he uses the word waste recovery. Okay, now. At first, I didn't understand what he was doing. But what, he, what he's done is that if you look at it from the outside, what comes out is pollution. If you look at it from the inside, then you are losing resources. So the way he put it to industry was that you are losing billions of dollars in what you're throwing out. And if you do this waste recovery, this is all the, all the benefits you can get. You know? and so he, he turned it around a bit. And and played on, played on their own. Um, what shall I say? Financial instinct. Stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, for the for the point of view, but it, it's an interesting how uh, how language uh, plays such an important role. Uh, today at lunch, uh, a professor here was saying how she teaches two classes, one in sociology and one in sustainability. And in sociology class, when she talked about coming on by the bus, they used the word loser cruiser. Not, not even thinking what they were saying. Mm -hmm. 
uh, a loser cruiser is something which you take if you can't afford a car. While is that in the sustainability class, uh, people didn't see it as a loser cruiser, but as something which, which, is, which is sustainable. And how language plays such an important role in the way, way people perceive things. Uh, so I think this whole fight towards making the world more sustainable is something which we need to draw on many, many disciplines. And this was also something which I learned. It's not only about science or social science, but it's about language, it's about arts, it's about culture. You know, it's, 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 it's an integrated whole uh, and connected with ultimately society as a whole rather than thinking that we basically do what we do and there is some person in some lab who will find a technological fix and that will somehow solve the problems of the globe as opposed to anything to do with us. And I think that realization really took me into education and, and, and understanding the vital role education could play in this. Well, which brings us to the Center for Environmental Education. Yeah. Right? And so tell me about that, because that started as quite a modest endeavor, and now <laughs> it's quite a massive endeavor. I know. Right? <laughs> I know. It, was, it, it was strange. There was um, a, a period of time uh, when, um, uh, again, I told you about the Ford story, about how about the greening. And I had taken a proposal to them. And they had seen that proposal, and they turned it down. It was a proposal for social forestry. And I was young enough in my 20s, so I went to ask them. I said, can you tell me why, what went wrong? And he said, every page, he said, I love it. And I finished the whole proposal. I said, what? You just turned it down. He said, we don't think with that money you can do this. Please put a proper budget and bring it back. You know? And he was right. He could immediately perceive the fact that I had cut down my budget so that uh, on someone's uh, hint to me that below this they'll pass it in Delhi, otherwise that just go to New York. Or that was a great learning experience. Uh, so when, when the Ministry of Environment was just being formed in Delhi and uh, I had um, the first secretary of that come and see us and he says, Karthike, you're doing these very interesting things in, in the Ahmedabad area, you're doing science education in schools, you're doing some amount of forestry, you're doing something with wildlife, you're doing something with urban areas. Shouldn't you do it at, at an India scale? You know? And I said, sure, if you can afford it. And if you don't kill what you like in us, don't give us a kiss of death, if you like, by, by making us government, or making us so stable that we, we are not hungry for you know doing yeah. things and doing things differently. And he said, try us out and we will do it. So we we worked on it, but we thought a lot, I must say, at that time, even at that age, in how do you build a partnership with government, which is unique in the sense that you want to keep it independent, uh, but you want to create a place with NGOs and, and civil society also feels equal ownership of that. And I, and I believe we have created such an institution uh, through a lot of experience of what you do and don't do, but which has now created an institution which, can, which is acting as a platform for wide-scale consultations uh, used by government and NGOs for changing public, public policy. But when we started, it was indeed a small group. But at that time, we had a big ambition. We said we want to uh, we want to reach every district of India, for instance, 600 districts. We want at least one school in every district of India to change. We were asked, uh, I remember, by the North American Association of Environmental Education, where I came in '85, soon after starting the center in '84, what the center's view was, and I gave a speech there, and and I said, um, I want our educational tools to be inspired by the Indian sari, which is, which is uh, an unstitched piece of cloth. But it's highly designed. But every person who wears it can interpret it in her own way. And it fits everyone. And I said our educational materials should be like tools in the hands of people. And they should be able to therefore use it in their way, and interpret it. It comes alive 
in the hands of whether it's the teacher or the, or the worker or the industrialist or someone else. We felt that however large an institution you build, it was going to be minuscule compared to the problem. I mean, our institution may look large from outside. And I tell people per capita, it's nothing. <laughs> you know, yeah. for, for the problems, it's nothing. And therefore, partnership was, was built into that institution right from the beginning. Learning from others, not reinventing the wheel, was also very important to us. We had, uh, I remember, uh, Nature Scope or something which was brought out of Washington, DC. And they asked us whether we could use some of our illustrations and what would be the price of it. And I said, I get thought about it. And we said, there's no price of it. But we should be able to use your material adapted to India. And you can use all of our illustrations. We did a barter. Yeah. And, the, and the magazine is going on 20 years, 30 years later. It's, it's still a strong, strong base. So we felt that partnerships was more important in building relationships. Because you can connect to ideas and people all over the world. And I think there is no one place which has a monopoly on what some of the good ideas for the future are. They're coming out of traditions. They're coming out of new societies. And every time I go somewhere, I see one idea or two ideas <laughs> and pick it up, you know, however yeah. small it is. But the whole exercise of building the center, we started in one location in Ahmedabad. We were doing programs elsewhere. And then one of my colleagues moved to the south. And we found that being in local areas being is m makes much more difference. India is the size of Europe, for instance. S so many different languages. And we had to work in every language. So over the time, we've built capabilities to do that. And that original dream of reaching a school in every district, today we have something like 400 schools in every district. 400? Which we reach out to. And, and therefore, it's 200,000 schools which, which we are able to reach out to. It's, it's, it's so heartwarming that you, know, you can dream mm. something like that. And as a result, some of the young people who join us, they dream equally. You know? And I think some of those dreams do come true. So I think um, it's, it's a very positive. Do they dream that. equally, or do they dream further based on? No, they dream the further. They yeah, dream further. Based I said, on what you've done. What, what I'm yeah. saying is, when I asked the same question to some of the thing, I said, what do you think? They, should, they said, every school, surely every school. And someone's going beyond that, saying, what about the children who are not in school? You know, and, and what about others? But I think they, they see it as something which needs to be done to, to change the world, to put it back in order, as opposed to doing something which makes me feel good. I might use just one towel for three days when I'm here, and that makes me feel good. But it's not the answer to everything. It's a good thing to do. But I need to do things which make a difference mm -hmm. as, as a society. And I cannot do it on my own. And no country can do it on its own. And India and Canada have to, in a sense, work together, as we do in several other countries, uh, uh, to, to, to reach this goal. And therefore, the, the pressure for that change is, to my mind, not going to come from governments or from any other institutions. It's going to come from people. And I have a strong belief that it's only when when people demand this of their governments, that they speak that language. You know? I think the people are, are you're, I think you're right, people are well out ahead of the governments on this. Thing. And it's, it's fascinating because I've done now some, uh, quite a few interviews with some really outstanding people, such as yourself. And I've heard that over and over again. I mean, uh, you know, I cannot be sustainable on my own. No country can be sustainable on its own. It's maybe the upside of the whole environmental crisis is that it forces us as human beings to surmount all those obstacles we've created between us yes. and, and do work together. Yeah, I mean, when, um, when we started to look at the planet as one system, mm -hmm. uh, I think that when, when we got photographs, for instance, for that, I think it started changing the way people thought. But I think um, today you also have social networking possibilities, which were unimaginable some time ago, yeah. and how ideas can, can, can go. I think people do need to feel, though, that you need to adapt ideas to local culture. You're, you're not looking for the silver bullets which will solve all problems. There's no magic one wand which will solve the environmental crisis and make it go away. It's, 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 it's thousands and millions of small things which people do. 
which which will which will ultimately do and do it differently. And what what might be right in one environment is not necessarily right in another environment. Mm -hmm. But the but the overall concern is the same. The the criteria for looking at it is the same. But the solution which it comes to might be might be different. Mm -hmm. And I think therefore that that shift in thinking that that you need to not take one idea and maximize it, but you optimize something. When, when Gandhi, for instance, taught of the spinning wheel, he was not trying to have the most efficient way of making yarn. He, he, he said, I'm looking at making yarn. I'm looking at decentralization. I'm looking at the way people's dignity is maintained, the fact that they can work in their families and do it. They don't need to move somewhere, and, and several other, other, other reasons. And you, you start looking at things holistically rather than just you know looking at it from a single single perspective you know i wondered about gandhi because you're the fourth i think indian that i've interviewed on this bunker roy vantana shiva sadish kumar um, and behind everyone stands this figure of gandhi and, sure. and if you're not talking very long before gandhi's name comes up and some of yes. his ideas come up and yes. i wonder what he would, what he would have thought about the whole environmental issue i suspect he would have had some very interesting things to say about it Absolutely, I think, uh, but it's not just he would have, he, he did uh, say a lot of things. He used different language. And uh, I'm, I've been connected with the Earth Charter. I'm on, on the Earth Charter Council. And we had uh, uh, the, the final meeting of Earth Charter celebrating 10 years of its existence at Ahmedabad, at our center. And I brought out a small publication of quotes from Gandhi looking at each one of the Earth Charter principles and what Gandhi said at that time, using different language, but what he said. And it's, it's remarkable how, how someone uh, thought about it. One of the ones which I use often is um, in a conversation with our leading industrialist. He said that, God forbid, that India should develop or industrialize in the manner of the West. He was thinking of England at that time. Because if he said if 300 million Indians, which was our population then, were to follow that path, we would strip the world bare like locusts on a field. You know, so he was very conscious that the development path needs to be totally different. We do need to develop, but not, we, not in the way it was. We need to learn from England and not imitate England. I mean, there's a complete difference in that. You're not negating it. You're not negating the experience of development of the West, but you should not imitate as much as learn from that. What are the things you would do or not do today if you could see the past industrial 200 years through the lens of, of sustainability or the lens of what you know today? And can we leapfrog that? And that was the big thing. My father used to speak about leapfrogging a lot when he spoke about satellite education, education through satellite communication. So you could you could get into villages where there were no roads. And and you don't have to follow the terrestrial path first and then go to satellites. You don't have the terrestrial link, so you could go straight to satellites. And many years later you now find that there are more mobile phones, for instance, in India than anyone had ever predicted. Uh, and this is because you you leapfrogged in many ways, uh, so that you can you new technologies can come in. But I think this is the great excitement and the challenge for a country like India, which is growing at eight, nine, maybe ten percent soon. That we we have to find new solutions, and we have to find sustainable ones. And and how do you bring about an education which gets people to do critical thinking? And that's my challenge. What would I what, what education would we, would we do in India so people, instead of just being imitative of what they see, are critical and learn from those experiences and then, then develop what they, what they do? So how do you develop critical thinking? I mean, it's one thing to convey information, but to develop a capacity for critical thought is a very different and much more difficult it's, it's, problem. It's, it's much more difficult, and a school system has tremendous inertia in it. Tremendous inertia because you have all these teachers and the teachers have grown up in the previous system. So how do you get those same teachers to do something differently? Uh, also teachers have got used to transferring basically information. 
knowledge, uh, how do you get them to uh, deal with a question which, which is difficult? And sometimes I'm asked by teachers, what is that one thing we can learn? You know, isn't there some mantra there? And I say, the one mantra which I know is, you should be able to get up in your class and say, I don't know. And let's find out together. You know, the minute you become a facilitator for learning, rather than uh, uh, someone who, who dispenses information, because that role of dispensing information is redundant today. Even, even while I'm talking, if uh, someone has a Blackberry, they probably check it out. Uh, before before you can even say it, you know, so, so, that, so that you have information available through the net, you have information available all over. And how do you, so how do you really uh, deal in that society and how do you change these roles? But critical thinking is, is, is something which um, uh, one needs to inculcate by really not killing it. I mean, I'm, I'm asked sometimes, uh, how do I inculcate curiosity? How do I inculcate critical thinking? To my mind, it's already there. Uh, I sometimes joke and say, it's like people asking me, oh, you're growing a beard. And I said, I'm not growing a beard, you're cutting it. You know, the growing happens on its own. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a reverse wrong question, growing a beard. Uh, and it's something like that, that I think a child is curious. And it's only later, as, as they, as they go through a schooling, that they stop asking these difficult questions. One parent said to me once, they become stupid. You send them to school and they get stupid. Yes. <laughs> my, my little, I've got a little four-year-old granddaughter who, who teaches me lots of new things. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she asked me, she said, uh, how come the people who work in our, in our household, the servants, why do they eat in the kitchen and not on the dining table? You know? And? No, so it, it was a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a valid question yeah. of of class and and, and the way society is organized and uh, how people are 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 working. Some people who are at home doing their job, whatever it is, their task. Others are at home, but the point only was it 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 gets me gets you to think that is this the right thing you're doing or not, yeah. and it, it probably isn't the right thing. But I think a child, if you listen to the children, uh, it's all there. Mm -hmm. they, they ask those questions. But there's another one which we've used at CEE more consciously. And that was to say that if I'm in one box and take a whole lot of assumptions for granted, I must realize that you are probably in another box which equal number of assumptions taken for granted. But if you are both to interact on, on a given problem, then by definition, we can't do it through our own boxes because we are both in two different boxes. And therefore, you get out of it and, and ask different questions. I ask stupid questions to you, and you might do the same to me, <laughs> simply because of ignorance. You know, Why do you do this? Um, and so we, we feel that for good sustainable development, we do need to put students and children in contact across continents. And today, that technology is available. You, you, you for, for Skype or for something else, there's so many tools available, Facebook, you know. You can even interact, you can even see, and there's no, no, virtually no charge to it. And I think this revolution has not caught up with the educational system. We, we still continue models, by and large, as if this, all this didn't exist, these tools didn't exist. Uh, we do use them up to a, up to a point. You know, but but nowhere near what their potential is. And I think today is a time when young people across the globe need to open up a dialogue of it's their planet ultimately. And, and the generation which you and I represent and this whole blip of 250 years since the industrial revolution to, to somewhat now has been a very important part for many things. I mean, you, you've managed to feed the world, you've managed to get droughts off the, the, in most places, you still have malnutrition, you still have other things, but you also did it at a huge cost. And, and how do you bring it back? How do you bring it back for the future generations? And I, it's interesting to think what 30, 40 years down the line, people will look at this, what they will call this 
these these years. But I think you must. Think they will come. How do you think they will view these years? Well, I think um, uh, they will be the a sort of years of innovation in a mechanical sense, but years when people were ignorant. And now it would mean irresponsible. It, it's okay, the first years of industrialization, you can say they were ignorant. But today, in 2011, they're certainly not ignorant. Uh, we know what most things are. We will never know it perfectly. And that's the, that's the principle. If someone keeps on asking you, prove to me that cigarette smoking is dangerous to your health. It took 50, 60 years before it went off aircrafts and it went off most places even after there was good evidence for it. And there's, there are many such things which, which we know about. There are forces which prevent us from doing it. And we can't afford those 40 years before we'll come to our senses. Or if we do, then it's being too much of a cost. Too much of a cost. Species are getting extinct by the day, by the hour perhaps. And yes, maybe you'll come to your senses 20 years down the line, in any case, because you'll have no choice. But at that time, it'll be too late for so much. And I think the trick is, how do we do it now? Now, um, yeah, we I think all the solutions, quite honestly, even if nothing new was invented, and you took all that is known in the world, and you could somehow implement it right, you probably can, can reach sustainability even today. Future, future innovations will improve it. But it's not as if you don't know. Yeah, the problem is here. Problem is here. Yeah, yeah. And, and the way we look about it. I mean, this affects the way we see things. Yes. You know, as I said, if I, I see a bus, then what do I see? Do I see it as, as the future or do I see it as the past? And, yeah. and uh, how do we view things? Which makes you wonder a bit about education because, you know, the, the usual, at this point in this kind of conversation, people usually say, so that's why education is so critical. And, yes. and it is, of course. but. It's also, that's a fairly long-term solution. And as you're saying, 20 years from now, we really don't have time to waste. Right? We well, which is why um, or to wait, at, right? at CEE, we have not looked upon education only in the sense of the formal education. That is something which is, which is much more fundamental, but it'll take its time. We are looking at many issues where we are using education in its true meaning uh, to look at immediate issues. Three we did last year, all three very interesting. The first one was that India has a long coastline, as you know, and there was a coastal regulation zone on what you could and could not do on the coastline. The government had come up with new legislation, introduced it in parliament, but then because there was murmuring, they asked us to do a consultation process. We did 35 consultations with fishermen right across India, I mean across the coastline, in all these different languages. And the solution was, people's opinion was unanimous, that this new legislation should be scrapped. And the government scrapped it. And they had another process immediately put up. And as a result of that, have come up last week with, with new legislation, which is based on all this dialogue which took place. We were introducing a transgenic eggplant, the BT Brinjol as it was called. Again, something which was passed, it would have been a disaster because India has 2,500 varieties of eggplants. And this would have increased your yield by maybe 5%, but you would have disappeared all these, you know, biodiversity and many other issues were there. We did again a uh, consultation process, came up with something, it's been put on a moratorium and on, on hold. So what we find is that we do as education and communication people to look at things which can be done immediately. How do you reach out to policy makers? How do you reach out to decision makers in industry? We are working very closely with some industries. Some of them have said, look, we know we have spoilt all these things, but we now want you to tell us what can we do to make it more sustainable. And, and we come and say, if you genuinely want to do it, let's find a model. CE is developing now a model of environmental monitoring we found that we've got good laws now, fairly good laws. And like anywhere else, laws alone doesn't work. 
how will you monitor it? How can you monitor a country as wide as India, where things are happening all over the place? So I, I in an open forum, asked our minister. I said, Minister, uh, do you realize that there is not a single square kilometer of, of our land where there is no cell phone? Okay. You have a cell phone everywhere. Suppose we were to make all those cell phones uh, work for us. That you anyone in India could could phone in uh, if a single one of those laws were broken. And suppose we built a call center which could handle that phone call and could sort out the, the prank ones or the malicious ones from the real ones. So if your telephone number did a prank, that number would get marked. But if your, you did a credible one, it would it, its credibility rating would keep on going up. So, you know, and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can we develop this? And he said, yes, have a go at it. So we've just done the proposal and I'm hoping it'll it'll work. I hate to tell you where that idea came from, but it's, it's. <laughs> no, I can't. It's, <laughs> no, can't I can't not ask, ask right? No, no. <laughs> I mean, that last Batman film, <laughs> the, the one place, you know, he finds at the end that there is no way he can find out how this is done unless yeah. he gets all the cell phones in Gotham City to, <laughs> to, to, to work for him, yeah. and which he does. And I said, my God, why can't, why can't I take that idea? And, and use it for the environment. So that's what I did. That's a brilliant <laughs> idea. So, so you never know where these ideas come no, from. No, no, that's right. I want to tell you. So the CEE CE get involved with these things in part because it's one of the few organizations that does operate across the country in all the languages and all the in all the different districts. Is that is that partly well, why you're because you're being asked to do a lot of things here? That yes, I think, I think there are two or three reasons why we get involved, and it's, it's interesting. Where one is, of course, the fact that we work all the places, but we work in all local languages. Yes. And that's yeah. very important. Secondly, we are seen as, as someone who can talk to industry, civil society, and government without the sort of blinkers of prejudice. Mm -hmm. You know, So we don't talk by you being a crook till, I, till you prove otherwise type of approach, which some environmental groups do with, with, with industry, for instance. Mm -hmm. or, we, or other groups talk, look down upon civil society like there are scientific groups which says, but we are the scientists, what do these people know? What, are the, what do the local farmer know? Mm -hmm. And the local farmer is actually working on the crops. He doesn't have the same language. But he's been working on that crop for, for all his life and mm -hmm. knows a lot of wisdom. So, so we, we, we do work multi-stakeholder. I think that's another one. Uh, I think people do like the multi-stakeholder. Our, our team itself is not people from the same discipline. We've got people coming in from different sciences, from social sciences, from journalism, from, from language. Uh, you've got people working in, at the field level and somewhere else which, is, which adds to it. And then something which we did 10 years after C was formed, we found that our credibility was not perhaps adequate. And we felt that everything we did we should have some place where we actually try it out ourselves. So we were having a major hospital waste management program. We used to lovely books and posters and everything else. But we had never actually run a waste management center. Mm -hmm. So we got an opportunity in the south, in a city called Gulbarga, to actually take a plot of land, build a, a facility, have three trucks, which go out every day to hospitals and to small nursing homes, collect all the waste, sort it out without any grant. Do it exactly the same way any industry would do it or any service provider would do it. And collecting those small $1 and $2 or whatever it will collect, making it viable and yet following the law. Now once we did that, our credibility vis-a-vis -vis hospital waste management is totally different. And what we said was also different because now we had experience. We have now experience with schools. We have experience working with industry. We have experience working with mangroves. We have experience working with wildlife. So what we've tried to do is to also get our people to soil their hands somewhere, you know, and, and learn from that. And I think that's, that's helped it. But it is, as a result, become rather a unique niche in that environmental space in India, 
and 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 I I hope we can really do education now at a scale which we used to only dream about earlier. Today we can think of these like this mobile phone thing. We can think of things and the minister saying, okay, try it out in three states. So maybe next week uh, this is what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to take it in three states and seeing how it will work. Yeah. You're actually modeling the education, Gandhi again, be the change you want yes. to see in the world. Yes. But you're actually modeling the system, the, the, the means of education that we've been talking about, right? I mean, yes. you're actually going out there saying, I don't know how to do hospital waste management, yes. but we'll learn about this together. And then yes. once you've learned that, then you kind of broker that out to other exactly. people. And it's not the same as it would have been had you not had the experience. I mean, this is all... Yes. This is critical thinking, isn't it? This is it is critical yeah. thinking, and it's also very Gandhian thinking. It's not only Gandhian, it's others also, but it's very much. Uh, another thing which we do is that when we went into industry, for instance, and we worked, we thought, how is it possible that we know about so many industries? It's not possible. We don't have that type of stuff. But what we said was, who is the best in the class? We went into an industrial area and said there are, say, 50 chemical factories here. Who is the best here? And we found one engineer who was doing it better than everyone else. And that engineer never thought of himself as anything other than a person working on that machine. We said, hey, you are the educator. You, you are, you, we want to make you the communicator. And that was not a role the person had ever seen themselves doing. So we transformed that person to talk to the rest. Now, if you can do that, for instance, as communicators, we only facilitate the best in the class from a sustainability point of view to talk to the rest. Then there's usually a huge difference between the best and the worst practice in anything. So you have a person who, who cleans the, the road for that matter, and you will have one who is so much better than the rest, or two. Can we, can we make them the communicators for us? So, so it's very much a facilitative role it's not only yes, a role of yes. uh, saying we know and talking down from a pedestal. And it's education as a very human, very social, yes. very informal, but very focused yes. kind yes. of thing, isn't it? And, and uh, so we do our formal stuff. I mean, we do our formal stuff. We, we work with the university, giving them a master's program in, in climate change and somewhere else we are working with School of Architecture. But it is coming out of, of playing a facilitated role ultimately. We are brokers to some extent of, of ideas. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we get an idea, we pick it up, and we sort of spread it <laughs> like nature does. But I must say that my main inspiration is not, not just Gandhi. Gandhi is, of course, a very important inspiration. But it's, it's nature itself. Mm -hmm. okay, that that uh, we, first of all, the arrogance to say, let us do something for our environment. I think that's that's the first wrong thing to say. Right? Instead of saying, let us learn from the environment to do something about the mess we have created. Yes. Which is what humans need to say, actually. You know? And the environment has been managing itself for, for billions of years, you know, till we came and really spoiled it. And the whole concept of nature is essentially cyclical. Children learn it in school. They learn the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the water cycle. It, it takes, it transforms, and it goes back. You know, it, it, it's cyclical. Because you are, limit, you are living in one globe, one planet. And thinking which has come about post-industrialized society is, is a linear thinking. That I start at one place, I take in resources, I move to another place, and I throw out waste. So I, I move up, I jack myself up, but through, through, through eating and, and throwing. Now, the concept of waste doesn't exist in nature. There is no such thing as waste. That word is purely a word for human society. And in many of my educational things, I, I say that. I say, let's, let's identify those words which exist only in human, but nowhere else in nature. And waste is one of them. And so if we can think differently of development, that, that we, we work it like a, like a spiral going upwards. We do need to change. We do need. We want amenities, we want this, we want that. We want a lot of things, we want certain comforts, but not in this highly wasteful, wasteful way. I think you would, you, would, you would be able to transform it, but you need to transform the way we look at development and the way we look at good being. I think it's not frugality alone. 
that's where that slight difference with Gandhi does come in, many of the people. But Gandhi is often under, misunderstood, I suppose, by saying that his only solutions are frugality and going back rather than going forward. Gandhi was not, in fact, like that. Gandhi had announced a prize for the most efficient charka, which was a product development prize, of at that time 100,000 rupees, which would be a huge amount today. Because he wanted innovation, he wanted change. But he wanted change which was relevant, which could be looked upon and can stand the test of not just one discipline, but several. You could look at it as a sociologist, you could look at it as a scientist, as an agriculturist, you could look at it in different ways and do it. And I think the space which we are trying here to create is, is first of all changing the word education to mean something formal. As you said, it's, it's, it's not a mysterious word. which and bring it down Changes, to a so language. So it's not something formal, right? What? So it's not necessarily something formal. It's not formal. something formal. Yeah. Okay. The formal system is an important part of what education happens. A large part of what we do know is from the formal system, but today a large part of what people learn is from, from advertising, for instance. A large part of what people understand is from the net, from, from talking to each other, from talking to their parents and others. Uh, we go to villages, for instance, and uh, one of the things, uh, I try is how do I bring a rural parent into the classroom? Because you go to a school and if I were to teach you as a child by denying everything your parents know, by saying that they are illiterate, mm -hmm. as opposed to they are, a, they are a wealth of knowledge, they might not have the same formal literacy skills because many of our people are not literate, in the liter but they are wise. How do I bring that into the classroom? How do I break this, this way of thinking. Well, you, you've, you've been you know, also interested in, in preserving traditional knowledge, right? Kind of recording it and making yes. a bit of a bank of it? And yes. Same. Yes, absolutely. This um, uh, traditional knowledge um, uh, and, and what's called the heritage of the country, which is, uh, which is not the non. Uh, not the material heritage, but the intellectual heritage, is, is so rich in every country for that matter. Uh, how do you preserve it? And it's interesting mm -hmm. that uh, a month ago, the Prime Minister's office has put together a small group to actually start thinking about this. And I was privileged of being part of that. But we now have someone as high up as that actually putting together a group, thinking how do you preserve uh, that, that heritage? Recording it is one thing. But uh, uh, it needs more than just recording. I mean, a simple test would be if I were to give you a recorded recipe and saying, uh, can you make that dish? You probably will make a mess of it, <laughs> you know? I mean, writing a good, good recipe is an art. Yes. You know, to, yes. to write a recipe so that the person who reads it can reproduce what you think they're going to make is, is an art. So. So how do you create people who know how to write that recipe? How do you, how do you, how do you document something like that? How do you document an agricultural practice, or or the speed with which you, which you turn, uh, the milk, for instance, or something else? How do you how do you record these things? We have tools. We have the we have the video. We have various other ways of doing it. But I think we need to preserve some of this, not as something which goes into a library but as living traditions. And what we found in the red plant example or in the rice, there are, there are so many farmers who are actually growing it the way it was grown maybe 100 years ago and understanding the way the nitrogen cycle is to be managed. So they will, they, will grow, they will go a legume so that they will fix nitrogen in the soil before they take the next crop. And, and they don't need fertilizers. They will, they will let certain insects be there. They will let the, the, the migratory cattle into their fields to, to graze it so that the remaining after they've cropped it is taken up by the cattle. The cattle gets feed, but it leaves its droppings there. And that fertilizes the soil. Now these are things which people have, have learned and they are doing it. So how do we prevent these practices from getting replaced? How do we keep them viable? How do we bring in modern uh, tools of management, for instance? If necessary, to still make them withstand the pressure of 
changing all this, buying a tractor, going for chemical fertilizers, finding for a few years that they are making more money, and suddenly their whole field has collapsed. All these nutrients have gone. What do, how do we prevent that? And I think for all these sort of, the arrow sort of comes back and saying educate, edu you know? Mm. As long as more people know that when they go into a place and they say, okay, I want to buy, uh, buy this rather than that, then everyone will change. If, if people are demanding organic, it will be organic. Mm. If people are demanding free rain uh, eggs, then it will be so. Is this the pick right program? It is the pick right mm. program. Because uh, uh, when uh, the United Nations Environment Program was being uh, for the World Environment Day was being launched there, and I was called to uh, as an institution to see how we propagated, it was called CO2 carbon dioxide kick the habit. And they said make posters and this and that. I said you must be mad if you go in India and say kick the habit. Because rightfully, most of India's citizens in the rural areas would ask, sir, I've not even got an electricity connection. Which habit do you want me to kick? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, it's an absurd sort of thing. So that's when we played with the word kick and changed it to pick. We made it pick right. Mm -hmm. And that was to make the right, right choices. How do we get people to make the right choices? Rather than propagate a choice, I mean, another approach would be that we have a small committee which selects the right things to do and then broadcasts them, sells them. And that would be the wrong thing to do because there is no one size fits all type of solution here. We want every citizen to make their choices in, in their own way. You're back to critical thinking, right? And you're back to critical thinking. Pick right is a critical thinking thing. How do you get people to think? It's okay to think differently. It's okay to think and it's okay for for parents and teachers to let children think. But again, when I see my granddaughters growing up, I see how small things their parents and people tell them has such a profound impact on them. How if you say the wrong things at that, that time, what it can have. And I therefore go back to my heritage, or the Sarabha heritage. And I was just discussing with somebody that I said, perhaps the greatest thing Ambalal Sarabha did was to let his children speak what they want and talk to them in a way in which he tried to listen to them, listen to their argument. That's your grandfather. My grandfather. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the thing he changed, outwardly there are many things he did very differently, but the one thing he did was to bring in that critical thinking. Okay. He, he sort of, he, he, he brought, brought this discussion into listening to children. And as I see young children now, I see that if you did that, uh, you, you, you really can, can, can encourage uh, that, that thinking, you know, that yeah. they are there. They let them ask the question. It's not always that you get what you want. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fine. You can say, look, this is the way you wanted it, but this is the way it's going to be. And I think, therefore, while we approach decision makers and we approach society as a whole, I still feel that what we are doing to transform education at the school level and the college level and, and what we're doing with youth is perhaps the most important contribution we could make. Yeah, well, it is the future, isn't it? It and is the future. You're, you're not speaking to the past or the it present. Is, you know, it's you're just speaking the to the future, which is, yeah. yeah. But you know, going back to your grandfather, what always strikes me when I hear about a man like that, and, and it just lights my heart to hear what you say about him, um, but that requires tremendous self-confidence. You know, it requires tremendous um, Courage, in a way, to, to you know, not to, to assume that you have all the answers and to yeah. listen really seriously to somebody else. That's not an easy thing for most people to do. It's, it's not at all easy. And, uh, you know, when he was doing his own school, which is totally different, many, many other people in the city of Ahmedabad, good families, rich families, said, can we put our children in your school as well? And he, he said no. He said no. Some people s thought that that was a snob value, you know, that he wanted to be exclusive. But what he said was that uh, he was doing something quite experimental and daring. 
and he didn't want to take the responsibility of doing something like that for someone else. You know, because later my, my aunt, Lena, did start a school on those same principles. But, but being able to take those decisions that, that he, he had to take at that time uh, was, was quite incredible. His eldest daughter, my aunt, uh, was very politically active. She worked with Gandhi, uh, close to the Nehru family, the, Indira, uh, the, the Nehru and Gandhi family. Um, worked with with women during the partition of India, but then worked in Kashmir, and it was and worked with the Abdullah family, who at that time was seen as traitors to the country. And I remember going as a young boy to school, and other children making fun of your aunt is like this, you know? <laughs> but he could support her. At the same time, not necessarily agree with her. And, and the feeling that you have to agree with someone to be able to interact with someone was really not there in the family at all. That you don't, I mean, people are individuals. and It's their basic integrity which you need to, need to somehow inculcate and preserve. But their integrity might be different from yours, you know, to make them whole. And rather than sort of stamp it out as one, uh, uh, you know, one die which casts all these people. So they're all rather unique, yeah. unique people. It's uh, such a huge strength. I mean, the, it's it's yeah. a huge strength, but it yeah. requires, it requires, as you say, uh, 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 certain courage mm -hmm. and a conviction mm -hmm. to be able to say that uh, uh, your child, for that matter, is growing up different from you. You know, and how dare he? How dare he? <laughs> how, dare he? <laughs> how uh, whether that passion? And how I'm do you, how do I'm how do the you culmination them? of the human race, don't you understand? Yes. <laughs> yeah. How yeah. do you how do you encourage encourage yeah. that? And and I think uh, um, it it is something which is happening now by default mm -hmm. because children are exposed to much more than what their parents are today. Today, uh, a child is no longer captive of their teacher and their uh, parent. You know, the child, the minute they have access, they are, they are seeing a whole world. And they but instead of, in, they understand, but instead of celebrating that world with them, some parents uh, think that they are able to deny that world to them, deny mm -hmm. certain exposure, censure, censor some part of that world to them, which you can never do. So it's a losing battle in any case. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, uh, so I think if, if, the young people of this world will say that we there's no more nonsense allowed. That this world has to be fixed. It has to be fixed in real time, and he just can't. He just can't have what we are doing now. I mean, it's 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 something which doesn't require rocket science to to be able to make out. You you have a situation where uh, I tell children that by the time they grow to my age, we'll probably be requiring four globes. Which don't don't exist. The four planets don't exist. Yeah. So you, you can't do that. One other organization that I and I must let you go. But I, one other organization I wanted to ask you to talk about a little bit is VIXAT, which I, I, is an NGO working towards people's participation in natural resource management. Yes. Um, well, VIXAT was really the first uh, organization which I was responsible for setting up. I had. Uh, I started working in the community science center, which my father had started. Uh, it was a young institution when he died. He died very early at 52. And it was an organization that didn't really see the future. And I worked in that first. It was in, involved in science and mathematics education. And I used to go out to villages and, and teach. Uh, and that was when I learned the usefulness of doing it yourself, uh, which, which is what I've applied later. And then we started with Vixat. But um, Vixat was the first institution on this hill called Thaltej. And the fact that I started working with the community around us and involving them, just as something which seemed logical to do. It didn't come out of some great theoretical perspective, which we now can put on it. We can put lots of jargon and words and things. It came out of that. But what we found was that when, whenever people manage their own resource, uh, 
they do it responsibly. People are basically not irresponsible. You know, so, and I think this is something which people in power just can't let go. They, they feel that if they were not there, everything is going to fall apart. People don't do that. People don't do that. People are essentially responsible. So <coughs> we started it with forestry. And uh, we found suddenly that all those trees which were otherwise getting denuded, the minute you let people manage it, along with government, suddenly the whole thing becomes green. The whole hill becomes green. You, we then tried it with water resources. And can people share water? Now it's a more difficult concept because if I put water, groundwater into, into my place, if you have a pump next door, you can draw it up. So people said, but why should I do it if the next my neighbor doesn't do it? And the concept that you should do something uh, even before your neighbor does it or, or till your neighbor does it, it's very important. And this is what the climate change negotiation is stuck on. It says you do it first and then I will do it. So they say, will India and China sign something? Then the developed countries will sign it. Well, India and China is just developing now. Our ecological footprint is is minuscule. Why don't you? And we've said that voluntarily we are going to do it in any case. India has a fantastic environmental program, some of which I've spoken about. So, so why do you want to say sign it first and sign? It? Because we feel that you who have used up so much of the resource and continue to use up so much of the resource are unwilling to put your pen on something till everyone else does it. You didn't ask that question when you started developing. Why don't you do that? So I think Vixat is a important thing. It's a field-based organization which, which works there. We also started in those days an organization called Sundarvan, which looks at small animals. And I remember little snakes which have something to say. I mean, people are fascinated and frightened at the same time. And it's, it's interesting. The only other thing which comes close to that is ghosts, which Capture the way of the imagination, I think. But snakes is a draw in any society. You walk out, instead of my speech, if I were to show snakes, I think we'll get more people uh, joining us. Because there, there's something very fascinating about something which you don't know. It's called the mystique in every society. And we thought, can we use it as an educational tool of letting people understand why they have the belief they have, rather than saying the belief is wrong. For instance, there's this red sand boa which the minute the mongoose comes there, it lifts its tail up as if it's a head. So the mongoose is busy looking at the tail while it can go from the other side and wrap it around and catch this guy. Okay, now the common word in Gujarati for that is a two-headed snake. But that's exactly what it wants you to believe. You know, So it's a defense strategy. So in the earlier education, they used to tell people, look, it's not two-headed. That's the wrong way of presenting it, saying that the two-headed mock two heads are part of its way of strategy. And that comes back to that point I was making earlier about nature, learning from nature. That nature has such wonderful systems of, of self-control, of, of, of being able to, to run a forest without a government in place, huh? having no waste, you, know, you don't need uh, these trucks to carry out debris and something else putting it, you don't need to add fertilizer, you don't need to add moisture. Compared to a garden, for instance, you need someone to weed it and you need to put all these things. Here, you, everything seems to be working on its own. Okay, because it's so well, each leaf in that thing is not random. It's, it's something. But the human idea of aesthetic and, and, and order is where the problem is. That we see a garden as something which is orderly and a forest is disorderly. It's, it's, it's again total nonsensical thinking. The garden is a total ecological mess because it needs fertilizers, waters, two gardeners, everything else. This one manages itself. But it just to the human eye, which sees order in very simplistic terms, it looks not right. It's like pre-Galileo pre looking at the star, you think it's all random. There's nothing random about it. It's just that till you feel the order, you think it's it's not working. So if, if humans could only learn from things which are all around you, 
it, mm. it, it, sustainability is there. Nature is sustainable. I mean, that's, that's what it's been doing all this time till we messed it up. It's, it's got hundreds of wonderful lessons of sustainability. People today call it biomimicry. They call it different things. How you learn mm. from nature. There are different mm. words for it. And there is incidentally a lot of interest in, in understanding uh, how a dragonfly flies. Should I design my new helicopter based on that or not? But we can use those lessons much more than just for defense. We can use it for, you know, for, for the way we build buildings, the way we keep ourselves cool, the way we uh, transport ourselves, the way we find right areas, the way we, as I said in the beginning, the way we find little niches to have social communication so people don't feel lonely anymore. You know, there are lots of learnings. Maybe the secret of sustainability is that we should just get out of the way. Well, we should not get out of the way, but we should immerse ourselves in the world we are in. We should understand that we are a part of this world. And we need to learn to live in that. We, we are a part of it. So we can't get out of the way. But we must not think of ourselves as in the way. We are not in the way. It's our, it's, it's our misguided thinking, which is to some extent putting us in the way. We are as much a member of this club of 35 million species as anyone else says, but we have an added responsibility being, being so powerful on this planet. We are very powerful in this planet, but we have a responsibility. We are, we are one of several species and let us think of it responsibly. Let us not get so bothered when, as that farmer taught me in Indian villages, if 5% of my crop gets eaten by insects, so be it. You know, good for me. Good for me that I've shared 5% of my crop for all these other species, whether they're birds or something, instead of thinking, how do I spray some deadly chemical, kill the bird, and ultimately kill myself. Thank you. This has Thank been you. just an absolutely <laughs> delightful conversation. Thank I've enjoyed you. it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. <laughs> Thank you. I hope it was okay. Oh, it was terrific. Thanks. It's Thanks. terrific. Thanks so much. I think that the most important and influential figure of the 20th century may well have been Mahatma Gandhi, whose example and whose thought have shaped generations of Indian leaders, and not only Indians either. Kartikeya Sarabhai's family worked closely with Gandhi during the struggle for Indian independence in the 1940s, and Gandhi remains a major force in Kartikeya's life. You can trace the influence of Gandhi and the other Indian thinkers and activists we've had the privilege of interviewing in this series. Vandana Shiva, Satish Kumar, and Bunker Roy. If you enjoyed this conversation, you may well enjoy those as well. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you next time.